as, <laughs> as much as I wish my, my book was number one on all of Amazon, it is number one in the humor section right now. So I will take that. It, it's called Like Living Among Scorpions. And I notice it is three o'clock. Now, what did Father Gately tell us we're supposed to do? Let's say it all together now here at the three o'clock hour. Jesus, I trust in you. I can't think of a better way to begin a talk. So thank you so much for joining me in that. Um, it, it, I love this conference. I am so excited about this conference in particular because it is so focused on the truth finding objective truth, not just how we feel good about what we believe, not just our experiences, but why do we believe what we believe? That's, that is something that really appeals to my, my little nerd's heart. As you'll see in my talk, my dad very much raised me to be a truth-seeking person. You know, he would ask me questions like when I would talk about how neat it was that people have landed on the moon. My dad is the type of guy who would say, well, why do you believe that? How do you know? Some people say it was a hoax. How do you know it wasn't a hoax? Now, of course, he didn't think the moon landing was a, host, a hoax, but he wanted to give me that kind of training. He very much instilled in me this desire to know what is true, to ask tough questions, to question assumptions, and to always seek the truth, even if it is inconvenient. And I always warn atheists, be careful about that because your kids will grow up to be Catholic <laughs> if you raise them that way. So, so I can't wait to get into that story. But I think what you'll see as you hear my story is that it is, it is the story of someone who was obsessed with knowing the truth, finally found it, but found that there was one thing she did not understand about the truth. And it's the most important thing that you could ever know. So I can't wait to share all that with you. Let's get started. Let's start at the beginning. I never believed in God when I was younger, not once, not even when I was five years old. I didn't wonder if there might be a God. I didn't feel anything in my heart. A strict atheist materialist worldview just seemed to me like it was obviously true. And, and I, I very much inherited this way of thinking from my dad. My dad is an engineer, his father was an engineer, got that great rigidly logical way of thinking. Now my, and, and he was an atheist, he, uh, he is, well actually, he says he's agnostic now, so pray, we're, we're moving in the right direction. He's the kindest man ever, takes my kids to all their activities, He is a good hearted man, so, so please say a prayer for him. But at the time, he was a staunch atheist. He had done a lot of research in his own life. He did not get the answers to the questions he was looking for about belief. He didn't have access to wonderful conferences like this one. So he became an atheist. But he always said that he was not raising me to be an atheist per se, as much as he was raising me to seek truth and question assumptions. Seek truth no matter what, even if it is inconvenient for you. That was kind of a, a motto of my upbringing. Now, my mother was not an atheist. She is what philosophers call a Macyist, and that is someone who is more concerned with whether Macy's has an additional 30% off this weekend than whether there's a compelling case for a monotheistic God. My mother is wonderful, also just super helpful, super generous, and she's one of those people who kind of feels like, well, I'm gonna try to be a good person. I'm gonna try to do the right thing. And, and I think she almost sees questions of theology as, as not relevant as long as you're trying to do the right thing. So I always tell her, you know, you're, you're on the right path. Just keep, you know, keep following that line of thought. So I, it just never occurred to me to even wonder if there might be something else out there. I, I was very much in this mindset of, you only believe things for which you can find evidence. It seemed dangerous to me to believe in things for which there's not evidence. I mean, I know this podium exists because I can, I can feel it, I can see it, I could weigh it, measure it. But the idea of believing in something that, that was just kind of out there that you couldn't experience with any of the five senses, it, it just kind of seemed like, well, how would you even know that was true? How, how would you know if you weren't part of some church that was manipulating you in, into believing falsehoods. So all my life I was an atheist and, and I really came to embrace my belief system in college. 
in college, I, I started out at Texas A&M. You might have heard of that university. Is there an Aggie in here? Did I hear a whoop? Oh my gosh, we've got some Aggies. All right, now, now Texas A&M, it is like the Steubenville of Texas, full of Christians, full of Catholics, bad place to be if you are a militant atheist. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Christians down there were doing their job well because I transferred. It was just too religious. I could not take the religious talk anymore. So I ended up at the University of Texas in Austin, and I looked around and I said, ah, atheists, yeah, this, this is more like it. This is the culture I'm looking for. So being in that kind of environment really helped me embrace my faith or lack thereof. And looking back, I am so glad you, thank you, Jesus, that this was just before the internet really broke and people could have blogs and put their opinions out publicly because my understanding of my own atheistic worldviews and worldview and my friend's understanding, oh, it, it, was, it was just embarrassing, some of the things we would sit around and say. I mean, I, I, re I remember having discussions like saying, oh, those religious people are so stupid. What about suffering? Why would a loving God allow suffering? Bet they never thought of that one. I mean, it was so embarrassing. We were asking the most basic questions and seriously thought that in 2,000 years, we were the first people to come up to this as 19-year-olds who knew everything. And in a perfect way to summarize this is if you ever want a laugh, if you ever want to read just the most fabulous, brilliant little essay you need to look up the London Review of Books, Review of Richard Dawkins' God Delusion. Now, you know that book. That's the book that your 17-year-old atheist nephew keeps telling you you need to read. It's something of, a, of an atheist Bible, and so many people say that, oh, it just, it just demolishes religion. Oh, he just, he just nails it. And the, I've read the book. It's, it's unbelievable. I, I thought that I would do a series on my blog showing where he was wrong, but in every, par every paragraph need to, needed to be addressed. He'd confuse Protestant Christianity with Catholic beliefs. Oh, the, I mean, to, to use the popular phrase, the thing was a hot mess. And that, that is modern atheism in a nutshell. I mean, throughout history, there have been some atheists that had some arguments that are worth dialoguing about, but the new atheists have none of them. So anyway, the London Review of Books, <laughs> they get a hold of the God delusion, opening line, first thing they say, it's one of my favorite quotes ever, they say, <laughs> imagine someone holding forth on biology whose only knowledge of the subject is the book of British birds, and you have some idea of what it feels like to read Dawkins on theology. But that was me. I mean, that was absolutely me. I was no better than Dawkins. I had all these half-baked ideas. And because, see, I was the product of this education system, of the modern education system, which teaches children facts, but it doesn't teach them how to think. It doesn't teach them, it, it, it doesn't help them distinguish between the different disciplines. It doesn't tell them things like, if you want to know the approximate number of galaxies in the universe, that is a question for science. But if you want to know why the universe is here at all, if you want to know why something exists instead of nothing, that is not a question for science. That is a question for philosophy. But me and all of my new atheist friends, we had no concept of that. And we were seriously steeped in this culture where we honestly thought that the scientific method is how you know everything. If you can't prove it materially, objectively, through the scientific method, it must not be true. We were a very lost generation. So to fast forward a bit, I started to work as a programmer at a high tech company. And that is where I met my husband. My husband is a really smart guy. He grew up poor, so poor, in fact, that I mean, his, his mother often didn't know how she was going to put food on the table. They, I, very often, they couldn't even run the heat in the winter. Well, now, it was Houston, so it wasn't <laughs> that bad. But, but he was very poor, 
and she had heard of these places like Harvard and Yale, and no one in her family had gone to college. I mean, she didn't know much about it, but she, she had heard that if you go to places like that, you won't be poor. And that is all she knew. She didn't even know where they were, but she knew they existed somewhere, and that if you go to places like that, you won't be poor. And so this is the type of guy my husband is. She told him to go to schools like that, and he said, okay. And he ended up going to Yale undergrad, graduating in three years, Columbia Law School, Stanford Business School, and studied in the master's computer science program at Stanford while he was there, because why not? <laughs> And he, he had this amazing network of people. He was actually, he had an opportunity, a, a possible opportunity, that if it had panned out, he would have been employee number 16 at a little company out there in Silicon Valley called Google. Uh, I, but, what, but if he had taken that job, he would not have moved to Austin, which is where we met. And I always tell him, honey, who needs billions of dollars when you have me? <laughs> And depending on the day, it's more or less a comforting thought. So, so he's obviously a really smart guy. So we, we met at a high-tech company. And, and so to fast forward a bit, so we got married. And one of the things I learned, it, we, had, we had a completely secular ceremony. I was really into this idea that we lived in a post-Christian culture. We weren't going to have anything related to Christianity at our wedding and we rented a theater. We weren't even married at our own wedding because like, I had to make a statement about how the state can't tell me if I'm married, married or not. It was very complicated. <laughs> and and you know, here's a little tip. If you are ever thinking about reinventing the wheel on a thousands of year old tradition, you might want to rehearse it first. <laughs> We were too busy planning the after party that ended up lasting for 12 hours, so it's good that we spent so much time planning it. We didn't rehearse our own ceremony, and Joe, he knows people from everywhere. He had people fly in from all over the world, but our ceremony, because we wrote our own vows and we didn't rehearse it, it only lasted seven minutes. <laughs> we had people from London, from Africa, and they were thinking, like, we flew across the world for this, and I, I wore a dark purple dress. And as I was walking out, one of my one of my Texan relatives in his cowboy hat said, "Where's the bride?" <laughs> Disaster. So, it, so again, the lesson is: <laughs> if you are going to reinvent the wheel on a thousands of year old tradition, just make sure you rehearse it first. <laughs> so, so we got married, and and a little over a year later, we had our first child. And I hadn't really been thinking of questions of theology at, at this point, about atheism, about anything like that. It, I, I, it, I'd kind of put it to the side. And this is something, this is kind of an arc that you see in a lot of young atheists. They're really into being atheists when they're in college, and then they kind of get a job, and they just, you know, they don't care as much anymore. So those, I, I had just really gotten into this blasé attitude about anything having to do with faith. But then it all came bubbling up again when my first child was born. Because, you know, it's one thing to mess up your own life. It, it's one thing to make mistakes in your own life. But when you have a kid, you really want to get it right. And it occurred to me that, you know, I'd, I'd had some questions about the atheistic worldview that, that I had never really explored. And, and I was still pretty sure it was right. But I started to think that maybe I should just make sure it's right before I pass this along to my own child. And then... Uh, and, and, and then just the experience of being a mother had such an impact on me. You know, something to understand is I, I grew up in very secular circles where, you know, babies were just not a part of the mix. I mean, I, I never had a friend growing up, never, who had a baby in the house. I don't think I ever had a friend who had more than two siblings, certainly no more than two siblings living at home. So I had kind of, I mean, I was so disconnected from that side of the human experience. I mean, I think in the back of my mind, I, I didn't know where new people come from. I, I kind of thought that, like, they all come from, from a cloning room at the back of Starbucks, and they walk out with their wire rim glasses and their latte. So, I mean, having a baby was like, whoa, I, I was really kind of knocked off kilter by that. And so I looked at this child when he was about two weeks old, and I, and I thought, what is he in a strict atheist, materialist worldview? Not borrowing from spirituality, not borrowing from Judeo-Christian tradition, not what I wanted him to be. What 
is he truly in, in the belief system that I claim to profess? That's something that my dad always trained me in. He says, follow your beliefs to all their logical conclusions. Don't flinch, really think through them. So I looked at this baby and asked, what is he in the atheist materialist worldview? And I looked down at him and I said, oh, he is the most precious little randomly evolved set of chemical reactions that came from nothing and will return to nothing. And I was like, this is just false. I don't believe that this is true. The love that I felt for that child was so real. And, and it wasn't that I just wanted it to be real, that this was a, a mother trying to impute more value than it was actually there. I knew that the love that I felt for that child came from some external source to the chemical reactions in my brain, was real in the sense that if the whole world blew up tomorrow, that love would be there and would still exist in some sort of eternal way. I knew that more than I had ever known anything in my life. And that was the first moment that I was no longer an atheist. So I knew what I didn't think was true. I didn't think that the atheist materialist worldview was true. The, the problem is that I didn't know what I did think was true. <laughs> so I, I, I thought, okay, so I'm not an atheist anymore. So what does that mean? And I thought, well, okay, so I guess I believe in some sort of spirituality, but you know, I, I didn't want to take that too far. So I thought, I thought I would do something crazy and say a prayer. Now I'd seen this in the movies. <laughs> and you know, I went to Texas A&M for a while. I mean, I'd seen people pray. I, I was aware that this is a thing that is done. But I had seriously, and I'm, I'm in my late 20s at this point, I had seriously never said a prayer in my life. And I didn't, I had all these questions, these really nerdy analytical questions like, well, how do you go, how do you know when you go from talking to yourself to talking to whatever might be out there? I mean, is there, like, do you go like, is this thing on, testing, testing? I mean, I don't, I really didn't know, and so, I said the lamest prayer anyone has ever said. I just basically said, uh, if, if anyone or anything is out there, things, plural, I'm, I'm in Austin, I wanna be open-minded here. I'm open to hearing from you now. <laughs> and then I said, amen, because I'd seen it on TV. <laughs> so then nothing happened. My room was still silent. There was no mysterious knock at the door with a message. I mean, look, I had seen the Hallmark movies. I had even occasionally seen some like Christian specials. And if I knew one thing about religion, I knew for sure that the moment you first say a prayer, things start happening. I mean, I, frankly, I would have expected a chorus of angels, some lights. Bare minimum though, crazy coincidence, you know, like someone walks up and hands me a Bible which would have been weird because I was in my bedroom and it was like two o'clock in the morning, but still, hey, this is prayer. It's supposed to make amazing things happen. So I just said, uh, well, there you go. God doesn't exist. So that's, that was easy. That'll move me on to the next phase. Because obviously, if a loving, personal God exists and wants me to know him, he would have responded in some way. So I, I looked at it like, well, I've I tried to call and it went to voicemail, so to speak. So I can check that off the list. Does, does a personal God exist who cares if I know him? No, so moving on. So I live in Austin, so of course I started dabbling in Buddhism. You're required by law to dabble in Buddhism for at least three months in my city. So I, you know, I started reading those books and then it's totally out of the blue. In, in one of the crazier coincidences of my life, I was in a bookstore and I happened to come across a Christian book. Now this was unlikely for a wide variety of reasons. One of them, uh, which is I had never been in the religion section, let alone a Christianity section of a bookstore or library in my whole life, with one exception. When I was in the fourth grade, <laughs> I took all the Bibles from the religion section and I moved them to the fiction section <laughs> in what was the edgiest prank the entire fourth grade has, had ever seen, I was convinced. 
So just so randomly, I, I come across this book, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, and I couldn't put the thing down. Now wait, I need to jump in and say something here. Usually when I name that book, and people know I was a lifelong atheist, converted to Catholicism, they've got out their smartphones, they've got it on one day shipping to their atheist son who's in college. It's, it's important to note, notice I'd said that prayer. It was a really lame prayer, but I had said a prayer a few months before. I could have come across this exact same book, and I would have laughed at it and thrown it aside just a few months before. So I was in a state of openness. Nobody will ever encounter the truth if they're not open to it. So, so it, it's important, as I say what's next, that you understand that I was in a state of openness. So I'm reading through this book, and, and it really caught my attention, but I'm still in the bookstore, and I had to go, and I thought, I can't, I can't buy a Christian book. I mean, what if someone sees me? I mean, I, I know people in this town. But I'm kind of like hiding it behind my back in case anyone I know is here. And, and I, I walked away, and then I walked back and said, oh, I, just, I have to get it. So I go up to the, the checkout, and, and then and other people started coming up, and I'm trying to get this book. And so I knew what I would do. I loudly said to the cashier, I said, I'll need a gift receipt for that that is a gift. I have a friend. She's a Bible person. I, I don't know. Gift receipt in that bag. I need it. Really need it. <laughs> so I take this book home, and I read it cover to cover. And it wasn't that it was perfect. There were some chapters. At least Strobel, wonderful guy. He's a Protestant pastor. Even now, there are some chapters, like especially about authority and issues that, you know, they're not perfect. But he said at the beginning of this book, he said, my goal is not to convert you to Christianity on the spot. My goal is simply to get you to see that this is worth looking into, that there is enough of a historical case for, for Jesus Christ being who he said he was, that you should explore it further. And I'll give you just one example. I mean, there are a lot of things that I found compelling about it, but to just give you one example, so Lee Strobel was interviewing a philosopher with a background in chemistry named J.P. Moreland. And Moreland is talking about the, the religious and social institutions that have been so important to the Jews over history. And Moreland says, he points out that, you know, these Jews believed that to abandon these social structures, such as keeping the Sabbath holy, animal sacrifice, would risk their souls being damned to hell after death. And this is Moreland talking. Now a rabbi named Jesus appears from a lower cl class region. He teaches for three years, gathers a following of lower and middle class people, gets in trouble with the authorities, and gets crucified along with 30,000 other Jewish men who are executed during this time period. Moreland goes on to say, but five weeks after he's crucified, over 10,000 Jews are following him and claiming that he is the, initi the initiator of a new religion. And get this, they're willing to give up or alter all five of the social institutions that they have been taught since childhood have such, in, have such importance both sociologically and theologically. Something huge happened in first century Palestine. And Lee Strobel pointed out, when, when, you, when you look at how much these people were willing to sacrifice and how many of them were for this new religion, I mean, be, becoming a Christian meant persecution. Lee Strobel pointed out that, you know, people might be willing to die or suffer for things that they think are true, but they're incorrect about. But you have all these people, but, but nobody is willing to suffer and die for something that they know is false. And yet you have all of these people saying that they are following Jesus Christ and that he is the Christ and that he is the founder of this new religion and they are willing to suffer and die for this. And, and Strobel said no one would be, all these people who claim to see Christ risen from the dead would not have been willing to do that if they were lying. And so he takes a step back and says, you have to admit that something happened. What happened here? And he proposed a really interesting theory. Maybe they really did see Christ risen from the dead. So that got me thinking. I was certainly not anywhere near ready to convert to Christianity. I had all of these negative stereotypes about this religion, but it did got me thinking, and so I decided to go get a Bible. 
I'd never owned a Bible before. I knew nothing about the Bible. I, I was as sheltered from this book as you could possibly be and live in America today. And it caused me no end of embarrassment. When we moved around a lot, I, moved, I lived in the Bible Belt many times in different places. And sometimes my parents would let me go to Sunday school with little friends, not, even though they didn't agree with the religion, they were not gonna get up early in the morning after I'd done a Saturday night, spend the night. So I ended up at Sunday school. And I remember one time that I, I always knew to use the line that when they asked where I went to church, I would say something vague like, oh, it's a, it's a country church. Yeah, you wouldn't have heard of it. It's, but I do definitely go to church. And one time the sweet Sunday school teacher took all the books of the Bible and did a game where you can put the books of the Bible in order. And she said, why don't we let our new visitor start? Oh, I had no idea, but I thought I could have, I thought I could make a pretty good guess. Like numbers would be in the beginning because that was probably a table of contents. Now I had heard of the names like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every author knows that you start with your strongest character at the beginning. So I went from numbers, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Now there's some big words I didn't know. So I put them at the end. Revelation would probably be first because you know, you kind of want to start with a bang. So she looks at this list of the books of the Bible and she leans down and she said, honey, where did you say y'all's family goes to church again? <laughs> I knew nothing about the Bible. And even in college, I intentionally avoided courses that, were, that would talk about the Bible, even from a historical perspective, because I was into this idea that we live in a post-Christian culture and it's irrelevant. So I skipped all that. So I get my first Bible and you know, I'd, I'm a writer, I like to write, and, and I know good writing skills, so I thought that, you know, I'd always heard that you should introduce your main character no more than 20% of the way into the book. That's a big writing rule. Now, Jesus, it, it, he's the main character of the Bible. I'm expecting him to come in about page 30. So I'm reading through it. I had also, through these Bible school moments, I had picked up through cultural osmosis, that there was something about there were fishermen, and they sang songs. And there was bread and wine. That was also in the Bible. So I am in Deuteronomy. Like, what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then like, thousands, the army was wiped out. And I'm like, where are the fishermen? This is crazy. And, so, and I was driving Joe crazy. Because <laughs> Joe, Joe would come home stressed out from work. And, I, and, and he'd say, oh, he has some problems. And I would say, Joe, have you tried sacrificing a bird over a clay pot and dipping its blood in yarn and hyssop? It's in the Bible. I'm reading the Bible. I think I know. <laughs> so Joe took me aside and said, stop, <laughs> New Testament. That's the New Testament. And so, and so, oh, that's what I was missing. And now I'm going to, you know, by this time I'd really, I felt something with this Jesus person. I felt like I was getting close to something real. And so I opened up the New Testament. It was a list of names, like just a bunch of names. And, like, and then you get to the end and it's like some guy's dream. And the, I, I was waiting, I wanted a bulleted list of like, here are the reasons why we believe what we believe. And there should at least be a strong call to action at the end. Like if you are convinced by this testimony, then here's what you do next. And it's like some vision, like I, I don't know what to do with this. I was, I could not, have been more confused. And, and so then, so, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna stick with this though. So I'm reading the New Testament. I did not see a clear case for what I knew to be the traditional Christian moral code. Abortion, euthanasia, the death penalty. I, I, did, I just didn't see this spelled out anywhere. And so of course I turned to the internet like a good nerd and I, and I would ask people on the internet, like, well, I'm just, I am not seeing this. And they would say, well, you know, you need to read the New, Te the old, the New Testament with the entire New Old Testament so that you know how to interpret the scriptures in concert with one another. And then it also helps if you have a biblical encyclopedia and a biblical dictionary, some reference materials. And I wanted to say, don't you guys have jobs? Because like, I, I have a, a little kid here and my husband works all the time and like, when is it that you think that I have time to become like a PhD in sacred scripture? Like I, this, is this really the system that God wanted to hand us? And by the way, guys, 
This is not a system that works without the printing press. None of the biblical in, in concordance and encyclopedia, those are all great, impossible for the average person to have before the printing press. I think I once read that it took monks something like 2,000 hours to hand copy a copy of the Bible. They were very expensive. And so I said, you know, the, the printing press was invented in the 16th century. What, how on earth could people ever come to know Christ before that, especially that they were out working in the fields, you know, they didn't have time to read the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the biggest thing that concerned me is when I would ask these Christians what they believed, everyone, like what the moral code is, every single person seemed to give me a different answer, but they all had scripture to back up their case. And so some, some Christians would say, well, we don't like abortion, but it is necessary sometimes and euthanasia is okay as long as it's compassionate death penalty you know i could kind of go either way everyone had scripture to back up their claims so here was the problem as someone who was totally unfamiliar with this religion what i wanted to say to the christians was i need a very fundamental question answered here and that is the question of who is jesus christ you guys are telling me that I should be part of this religion. And so I need to know who is it that you want me to follow? Because let me tell you, the Jesus Christ over here who says, hey man, whatever y'all want to do is cool. Marriage, whatever, however you want to define that, that's cool. Abortion, contraception, death penalty. I, you know, really just as long as you feel positive things in your heart, I'm down with it. That is a different Jesus than the Jesus over here who calls us to the very highest standard of love for our, human, for our fellow human beings, who says that marriage means a very specific thing because it is the protector of new human life and it is the protector of human love, who says that we must respect all human life from the moment of conception until natural death. That is a very, very different Jesus than the happy-go-lucky Jesus over here. And I could not get a clear answer from modern American Christianity about which Jesus I was supposed to believe in. Now, meanwhile, I had started a blog because that is what you do when you're a huge nerd and you're having an existential crisis. I, I did not have a lot of Christian friends. Oddly enough, a couple decades of being a loudmouth militant atheist does not leave you with a wide social network of devout believers. <laughs> so I thought, maybe I could find some Christians on the internet. Kind of an interesting side note, my blog, obviously, when you start a blog, you don't have any readers. So I recruited people to come talk to me. I went into some really heavy, heavy atheist forums and, and I would find people, they, there were tons of Christians, but I handpicked 10 or 15 who did an amazing job of just demolishing atheist arguments. It was embarrassing for the atheists. They knew more about history than the atheists. They knew more about science than the atheists. They knew more about the human experience. And, and again, this was a small percentage of the Christians on there, but I said, these guys have something that's real and I want it. So I emailed them individually. I would find out later to a man to a man, every single person I had identified as being able to demolish atheist arguments was Catholic. <laughs> but at this time, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at this time because I just started the blog. So I had those issues of not knowing who Jesus really is. So I go back to the blog and I said, guys, I, uh, I hate to tell you this, but I have got some bad news. Your religion's totally bunk. I'm sorry, it's, you know, I've been investigating it. Can't get a clear answer on your moral code. Can't get a clear answer on who Jesus is. So, you know, there, no one knows how to interpret the Bible. Everyone, it's like their own personal book that they like project their personality onto and say it's from God. This is a disaster. So there you go. And I kind of thought they would be like, well, that's a great point. Does anyone know where the nearest Buddhist temple is? <laughs> Can't argue with that. But they came back and they said something really interesting. They said, what if before Jesus returned to heaven, he founded a church, one church, 
that he instilled with his own authority. What if he did with this church what he did with the writers of the Bible and that he took fallible, imperfect people and used them to convey infallible, perfect truth? What if he s promised to stay with this church to the end of the age so that it could speak truth to all cultures in all times, in all places? And, and I heard that and I said, this, yes, this theory makes so much sense. This explains how people could do Christianity before the printing press. This explains how illiterate people could come to know God. That was another question I was wondering when people were telling me about in biblical encyclopedias and concordances and reading the whole Bible, I thought the world literacy rate is only 80% and that is much higher than it's ever been in history. Like how do illiterate people ever know who Jesus is? So this explained this, this idea of this living church. It explains how illiterate people can come to know God, people without free time to read the entire Bible. Th this makes so much sense. Yes, yes, yes. And they said, that's the Catholic Church. And I said, no, no, no. What? What, what are you talking about? I, I can't become Catholic. I mean, obviously, it's, it's archaic. It's patriarchal. It oppresses women. I mean, I, you name a bad stereotype about Catholicism, I had it. So I said, no, no, there's no way I could become Catholic. And Joe, he was, so Joe was, at the time that we got married, Joe was kind of a lukewarm, very much fallen away Southern Baptist. And so he, he had all the anti-Catholic stereotypes. And so he, he'd been kind of following along, sort of amused with all of this. And so he, 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 when, he, when he saw this turn of events, I mean, this was just, I had just gone off the rails. And he said, you know, it's bad enough that you've been messing around with this Catholic stuff. And now you're messing around with these Catholic internet people. You need to, you need to take a step back. But I said to him, I said, Joe, I don't have anywhere left to turn because this is the only theory within Christianity that is even possible. And, and I said, I, I, I think I am onto something with this Jesus person. I can't explain it, but I feel like there is something there. And I have nowhere else to turn but the Catholic Church. And somewhat reluctantly, he, he agreed and he got on board with me. And so we both began researching this. We bought all the books. We had stacks and stacks of books. And it was kind of interesting to see how his questions as a Protestant differed from mine. Like he was, he kept wrestling about the role of Mary. That, that just made so much sense to me from the very beginning. I, I mean, not that I wasn't sure if I believed all this, but I said, look, uh, let me tell you this, Joe. So God, the creator of all the galaxies and all the stars and planets in the whole universe. So he, if he, ca if this is true, that he came down to earth, then that means he got to choose his own mom. Don't you think she'd be pretty special in the one true church? You think maybe? <laughs> yeah, Marian devotion, boom, easy. But I, I had, I had, I had, <laughs> I, had di I had different issues that we had to work out. But the big thing for us was the most controversial issues of the church, abortion, contraception, when we realized that the church was right on those issues. I mean, we could not have been more shocked. I, I, I was always militantly pro-choice. I donated to Planned Parenthood. I, I, I was as pro-choice as you could possibly be. I didn't even know you could be pro-contraception. I thought it was an urban legend that anyone was even anti it. So, so when I read the Catholic Catechism, I was shocked that even the stuff that I was most certain that I would disagree with, it just made sense. And it was the most internally consistent belief system I had ever seen. And when I read it, when, when I found out what Catholics actually believe, Joe and I both agree. We, we had all these different perspectives, but we both came together on one thing. We looked at this and we said, it's like we have discovered the owner's manual to the human soul. Whoever put this together, whoever put this body of wisdom together knows us better than we know ourselves. So this was the final thing I had been looking for. All along, I had been wondering, as I was getting closer and closer to the church, I thought, 
well, how would I know if it's true? I, I mean, this theory makes sense, and it, it all sounds right, but this is, this is a big leap to become Catholic. I mean, how would I know if this church really were guided by God? And what I had come to is I said, I, I would need to see something here that humans cannot do on their own. I, I would need to see the fingerprints of God somewhere. And when I saw this moral code that was so reviled by the world and so counterintuitive, yet was so perfect, and it was like everything that had been written on the human heart just poured out and clarified. And when I saw that this church has been teaching this same truth, never reversing itself, saying the exact same things for 2,000 years after empire after empire has fallen away around it, I said, here is something that humans cannot do on their own. I had found the fingerprints of God. So Joe and I both became Catholic at St. William in Round Rock, Texas. That's, that is still our parish today. We both became Catholic at Easter Vigil 2007, and that's where the story should end, right? You become Catholic, and then you don't have problems anymore, and life is easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what I expected, frankly. I mean, it seemed pretty cool, like God's on my side now, so we've been, and I know the truth, so, whew, boy, I'm glad all that suffering is over with. <laughs> oh, little did I know. So right before we became Catholic, I mean, a few weeks before we became Catholic, I got a deep vein thrombosis here in my right leg. That is a blood clot in a major vein. They are very dangerous. It was in my second pregnancy. It turns out that it was caused by a blood clotting disorder that makes pregnancy very dangerous for me. It makes it likely that my, that, that my blood will clot when I'm pregnant. It is a rare disorder. It is an inherited disorder. And I inherited it from both parents. And the hematologist, when he diagnosed me, he kept, there was kind of this look on his face, and I think he was trying to find a delicate way to ask, did your parents meet at a family reunion? Or is there something you're not telling me? I mean, nobody has two copies of this gene. So it's, it, it's really crazy. And, and it's, again, it, the, the big thing was that it made pregnancy just a mess. So first of all, treating this issue that I had, it was enormously expensive. We were self-employed, had really bad insurance. And then also just the, the stress of going through all that. And so we, we were just kind of in a bad state. We also lived with my mom. Joe was starting a business. It was just a really rough time. And so then, in my first lesson as a Catholic, that God's timing is somehow, sometimes different than your own, our third child was on the way just a few months after my second got here. And this was, I had barely healed from the DVT. Oh, my doctors, I thought they were going to kill me with their bare hands. I mean, they, 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 just, they, thought I, they just thought it was so crazy. But we did, we were able to manage this condition with this blood thinner. The trick is the blood thinner costs $1,000 a month. And that is, that's, my insurance covered it. That was my portion. It is outrageously expensive. I mean, you could like, buy, I, I used to think of what, what else I could buy for that money. So we had been wiped out from the last pregnancy. We still lived with my mom. There, weren't even, there wasn't really even room for me and Joe to live with my mom. So now bringing a third child into the mix, it was, it was a low time for me. I was so stressed out about money. We were on the brink of bankruptcy. And I, I thought, this is, a, a, so I guess Jesus was serious about all this stuff in the New Testament about how you're going to suffer if you're a Christian. Oh, this is lame. I thought it was going to be, I didn't think he was serious about that because, I, you know, I'd read all this stuff. But, ah, oh, because, you know, the Lord had, had really called us into this life of, you know, we used to live downtown and drive a Jaguar and all that. And the Lord seemed to be calling us away from that. But I was saying, this, this is miserable. This is hard. I am not happy. I do not like this, this Catholic life thing. So at that time, I, I, I was kind of trying to pray in my own bumbling way. And, and I just told the Lord, I am miserable, and this is too hard, and I don't think I can do this, frankly. And so this quote came to me, and it's one of those things, I, I just, I read it somewhere. Someone posted it on the internet or something. And it was, I don't know if you've ever had a moment like this, but I just... I knew that these words were what the Lord wanted me to hear right now. It's from Blessed Elizabeth Hesselblad, and she says, Dear Lord, I do not ask to seek the path. In darkness, 
in anguish and in fear, I will hang on tightly to your hand and I will close my eyes so that you know how much trust I place in you, spouse of my soul. As I reread those words, and again, I, I can't explain why, but you might have had a moment like that. I knew that they were the Lord's words for me. What he was saying was, close your eyes. Let me do this. You have been a control freak your whole life. <laughs> it's time for you to have a rest. But here's the thing. This idea of trusting the Lord in a real way, uh, that I'll just tell you, that is not what I signed up for. I thought that being Catholic was like, you know the truth and you follow the rules and you have less free time on Sunday. <laughs> Trusting God in a real way for a lifelong atheist, that, that just sounded crazy, that just sounded irresponsible. So I, so I, I told God, I, I was actually in the Adoration Chapel, I went to the Adoration Chapel and I said, I don't know how to trust you. I don't even know what that looks like. But I'll just tell you this. Here's some problems I'm having, God. And you can tell me what I'm supposed to do about them. I don't have a house. I don't have a place to live. You know what that's like. That I, I, I have nowhere to go. <laughs> I can't afford this medicine that I need to save my life. And frankly, even if I did have a house, we used to live in a loft downtown. I don't have furniture for a house. So there you go. I know that, you know, it's not supposed, prayer is not supposed to be like an ATM machine, you know, where you get exactly what you want. But I didn't know what to tell the Lord other than what I needed. The next day, I go to the pharmacy to get my $1,000 prescription. But I realized that morning I didn't have money. Couldn't afford it. We just barely didn't qualify for financial aid programs. Sometimes the people at the pharmacy, if I looked pitiful enough, would take mercy on me and give me some samples. So I went down there and I, I gave this girl my name. I said, I'm Jennifer Fulweiler. I have a prescription. And I was about to say, but I can't afford it. Do you have any samples? And she just starts typing and says, that'll be $30. And I said, no, <laughs> no but unfortunately, I've been through this a lot. It's not $30, so double check. And she said, no, I see it right here, it's $30. So I got my full prescription walked out for $30. Week later, Joe and I were driving through the neighborhood, happened to see a for sale by owner sign that had just been up, that had just been put up a few hours before. It was the perfect house for us. It is the house we still live in today. We got it so cheap from this owner who just wanted to get out of there that the mortgage company made us sign an affidavit swearing that we did not have a previous relationship with the owner because it was so cheap, they couldn't believe that we got it for that price. Furniture, I, I, I told God, I was like, I need a coffee table, a sofa, a refrigerator, and lawn furniture. Hey, you want, you want me to close my eyes? I mean, all right, close my eyes, this is what I need. <laughs> my dad got a job overseas, had a bunch of furniture he wanted to get rid of, asked if we needed any of it. Two of the items included a sofa and a coffee table. My mom, who had not known of my prayer, said she was sick of her fridge, had wanted to get rid of it. Could we take her refrigerator? The owner just of the house, who we bought the house from, just before he left, he said he was going to a condo where all the yard stuff was taken care of. He left us his entire suite of lawn maintenance stuff as a gift. Every single prayer was answered. And, and, and because I'm me, I was like, Lord, was that from you? <laughs> I, re I really, I was like, well, could, I mean, it could have been coincidence. I mean, you know, atheist training coming here. So I said, Lord, Lord, was that, I mean, I don't want to be irresponsible. I mean, did, are you telling me that I can trust you? Because, you know, you've only answered 50 prayers in a row because I'm, I'm really not sure. <laughs> With this prayer on my lips saying, Lord, is this your sign that I am supposed to trust you? I went back to that same pharmacy I went to pick up my prescription. Oh, yet another answered prayer is we got new insurance that would fully cover my medicine for only a $50 copay. So from $1,000 a month to $50 a month. But the new, the new insurance would take effect in like two weeks. So I thought, while well, I still had the old insurance that was now for whatever reason, $30, I would just save 20 bucks. I'd go down, get my $30 refill before the $50 plan started. So I go down there, same pharmacy, and I go to pick up my prescription, and the guy rings it up and says, oh, that's expensive, oh, wow, poor you, the, that'll be a thousand bucks. And I said, and I mean, it was okay, because again, the new insurance was about to start, but I said, 
No, no this, it's $30, I know. We've been through this, you'll see, last time it was $30. And he did some typing, and, and I said, look, look, uh, look up when I was here last time, I got this stuff for $30. He types some more, and he looks at me and says, ma'am, there is no record of that transaction. Now, the takeaway here is not that God just gives you whatever you want under the sun. I mean, because if it were, I mean, I've, I've been telling God, I have my eye on the iPhone 6. You know, if he wants to continue this role. <laughs> the takeaway is not that you give, give uh, the Lord your shopping list. and like he, It's like Amazon, you know, it just sends everything to your doorstep. For me, what that answered prayer was, was letting me know that I can trust him. Because before that moment, I had thought of being Catholic as an intellectual endeavor. Like you might decide to become Republican or Democrat or Libertarian. I had examined the issues and I had come down on the side of Catholicism and that's all it was. And what I learned with what happened in my life there is that Jesus Christ is a person. And that the truth that I had always been looking for is not just a concept but is a person. And that is what I want to leave you with here at the conclusion of my story. The biggest thing that I learned through this crazy conversion, it is the most important lesson in the world, but it is so easy to forget. And that is that the truth is not a concept, but it is a person, the living person person of Jesus Christ who is with you and will take an active role in your life and he will help you in anything you go through. And until you understand that, you will never fully understand the truth. Thank you.